Hello everyone and welcome to Meet Delic's first session of Mushrooms, a three-part live stream series powered by Midison. My name is Kirby Duncan and I'm the marketing director here at Delic Corp and we have got a great event for you today. First and foremost, we want to thank our sponsors, Midison Innovations Group. Midison Innovation Group is an emerging biotech and life sciences company dedicated to developing and commercializing innovative solutions for treating mental health problems and enhancing vitality. At the heart of Midison's core philosophy is that psychedelic assisted psychotherapy will continue to gain acceptance in the medical community with many of the world's best accredited research organizations demonstrating its remarkable clinical effectiveness. For more information, head to Midison.com and be sure to follow them on social media. Before we get into the speakers, I wanted to share a couple of announcements. As a reminder, this is the first of a three-part series, so be sure to join us for our other events. Head to meetdelic.com backslash virtual. We'll drop those links in the chat and be sure to follow us on social media at meetdelic and more. Here at Meet Delic, we've got a lot of exciting things coming down the pipeline, including Meet Delic, the live in-person event happening this November. Medelic is the world's premier psychedelic and wellness edutainment event, catering to holistic healers, revolutionary businesses, and thought leaders. Held in Area 15, an immersive and experiential entertainment complex in the heart of Las Vegas, the exciting two-day event features industry entrepreneurs, psychonauts, and leading voices in research, science, and wellness. Joining us today, we have three people who support providing integration services to their client from a variety of disciplines. First up, we've got Roan Kaufman. Roan Kaufman earned his doctorate degree in educational leadership from Fielding Graduate. His dissertation work was on how ayahuasca can be a social change agent and move us from Western worldview to the indigenous worldview. Roan's approach to psychedelic integration is to respect each person as an individual and unique and honor what each person needs. His work is grounded in indigenous worldview of plant medicine work and shamanistic healing. Next, we've got Sophie Whitley. Sophie received her MA in psychology from Columbia University's Spiritually Mind Body Institute. She is a certified yoga teacher and meditation teacher and is currently pursuing her doctorate in clinical psychology. Through her work, Sophie assists individuals who have had psychedelic experiences and whom are looking to ground and integrate that experience into their day-to-day -day lives. Her integration orientation and approach are based in depth and transpersonal psychology. Jill Coisey joins us. She is a registered professional counselor and master practitioner of clinical counseling. She has over 13 years of experience with integration work, and she's been involved in the fields of psychology, meditation, and holistic health for over 30 years. And last but certainly not least is Nick Martin from MindLeap. Nick is the director of community at MindLeap Health. He's completed his master's in counseling psychology from Boston College. Nick has experienced conducting research centered on masculinity and substance use, building peer-to-peer -peer support groups, and working in applied settings with adolescents and young adults. At MindLeap, Nick is dedicated to providing the platform that brings together inner wellness and psychedelics. All right. And so for our first event, we are going to be diving into exactly what psychedelic integration is. We're going to be talking about the importance and preparation, what it means to integrate, and learn about the tools um, that are available to you throughout the process. So to kick things off, I thought we'd start with the question, what does psychedelic integration mean to you? Um, so Sophie, do you want to get us started? Sure. Happy to start us off. <laughs> um, so first of all, I just want to say this is a proposed definition that I will present. It is not the only definition. And I think we're all sort of figuring out as we go along what exactly psychedelic integration is. Um, I think of it as the process by which a psychedelic experience translates into positive daily changes in an individual's life. Um, so it's a process. Um, we don't arrive at an integrated state, right? It's a process by which we're learning, growing, um, and this can be occasioned by psychedelic experience. Um, I also think of it as a process of reflection and connection. So reflecting on what perhaps occurred or came up for us in a psychedelic experience and then seeing how the connections can be made between that experience and the way we live our own lives. Um, so that's just a proposed way of thinking of it. Amazing. Jill? I don't know. Sophie, uh, she pegged it right there. I, I really like your definition in that. Um, it, mainly for me, what's really important about working with people with uh, for integration, the definition is 
how do they take their psychedelic experiences and move forward in their life? And how does that shift things for them? So we're looking for actual shifts, not just, okay, I've had the psychedelic experience. Now I'm going to go on and then things can be forgotten, but how might I be able to integrate this into my everyday life? And how might that change my relationships, my outlook on life, um, how I live my life? Amazing. And how about Roan? Um, I appreciate what everybody said so far. I guess I'm going to look at it more like from a spiritual perspective. So, you know, you have this mystical, sometimes initiatory experience and all this information is coming to you. And maybe some of it's not necessarily positive. Maybe some of it's challenging or it's hellacious or it's showing you parts of your shadow. And so for me, when I work with people around integration, I'm looking at like, what are the lessons around the body, the mind, the spirit, the emotions, and unpacking those. And also in the thing that maybe I'll talk about this later, it's like, how am I dialoguing with these plant spirits? Like I'm in this dialogue with this medicine. It's not just that I'm having this weird experience. It's opening me up to something that is, you know, it's showing some, me something about my life. So I'm, you know, I would go a different, slightly different angle, but I appreciate what everybody said so far. Amazing. Well, guys, I think it makes sense to start at the beginning of the process, right? So for any psychedelic journey, preparation is key, whether it's intention setting, expectation setting, just to make sure that you have the right env environment for the journey. So, you know, Roan, what, what does it mean to set intentions? Who, what goes into that? Um, I mean, I think it's like if you're going to go you know, you're going on a trip, you want to say, I'm going to go to Chicago and I'm going to drive there. You want to have, you know, some goals in the experience. I mean, there's there's nothing wrong with just saying, I'm going to have this full cyber experience and have a mystical experience in the woods. But some of it is, you know, there's a difference, I think, between kind of coming to psychedelic medicines with a real healing intent or with just an exploration mind. So I think part of it's knowing yourself. So if you're going to start preparing and, and um, for a healing thing, you want to look at like, what's not working in my life? Where am I suffering? Where's my heart pain? You know, where am I having pains in my heart in my life that I want to get some healing from? Or what are the insights I want to bring? And those would guide the questions that you're going to bring to the medicine. I, I just want to say one more thing, though, at least my experience is, you know, you have this intention, and I use this example in my books, like, it's like you order a, you know, you want a pepperoni pizza, but you send it to the psychedelic medicine, and they're going to give you one with anchovies and onions and all, not necessarily what you ordered. So some of it's putting your intention out and then using that later to find find your answers over time, like the other persons has, has, have suggested over time, unpacking it, so. That was beautiful explanation. Thank you, Roan. Um, Jill or Sophie? Yeah, if I may, I just, um, the one thing about the intention, uh, just to kind of payback on, on what you said, Roan, is uh, to, it's, I think it's very important to set that out at the beginning. And I found that it can be used sort of in one of two ways. One is an anchor to keep coming back to throughout the journey. And, uh, and the other is, okay, this is, this is the intention that I'm setting out at the beginning. And um, how flexible am I as I see things changing throughout the journey? Yeah, I appreciate what everyone said. And I think not to get ahead of it, but to use an intention also as a retrospective point um, later, it really helps someone understand what has occurred in the unfolding process after they set the intention, after they had the experience. They can then reflect back and see, oh, actually, how is that arriving and arising in my life now? Um, even though as her own so skillfully described with pizza metaphor, um, that you, you sometimes don't see the intention right away. You don't see that it actually came to you right away. It can come in a different form. And then later, you know, weeks or months, you'll see actually, in fact, you did receive, um, answers to your intention. Awesome. And Nick, do you have any thoughts on intention setting as it pertains to mind leap? Right. Yeah. So Mind Leap as a space for virtual integration to take place. And I'll uh, have an opportunity later on to tell everybody, the listeners included, a little bit more about what that looks like. But, um, you know, Mind Leap deals in a space where we provide support for people um, not 
in a psychedelic experience and not in the short-term care, but rather in the long-term care. So intention setting really plays an important role into that. And like Sophie had just alluded to the intention and everybody's spoken about to an extent is that the intentions can come back up at any point. Um, right. And the intentions that somebody has, you know, at time period X might be different at time period Y, or they might be the same thing. And uh, really what mind leap does is provides uh, support for people wherever they're at on their journeys. So, uh, there's a lot of ways that intentions can come up, not only before a journey, but also after. Sure, thank you. Herbie, um, can, I, can I say one more thing about that? Of course. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I didn't used to think that the preparation stuff was as important. And I, you know, over time, I really have found that that's as critical as the experience itself, as critical as the integration. And, and when I interviewed um, some of the the guys at John Hopkins, who, Johns Hopkins, who were doing the psilocybin work, they prepare people for like, you know, it's like 12 hours before one session. And I just thought that was an interesting data point. Like, wow, you're really digging in that much with intention and building in skills before you're even going to have this experience, which is equal and dis equal and timed to the preparation. And like, I, I took that as like, wow, I've been maybe mis mis you know, not thinking about this as clearly as I could. So I just wanted to throw that out. Yeah, I mean, that brings up a really great point. So how do you work with clients directly to help them start thinking about intentions and setting those? Me? Or, oh, yes, Ron, I'm sorry. I, like, I, and I, I think all of us would agree. I mean, I think there's just a series of questions that you're going to ask people to meditate on and, and journal on. I mean, I like I write worksheets and I have like little PDF books that I have people fill out. And it's more around like, what are, what are you hoping to gain and what's not working and really to spend a lot of time kind of self-reflecting on what do you want to get out of this experience and also how do you come into it in a humble way and a respectful way not that i'm taking these drugs and they're gonna but kind of approaching the whole thing from the beginning even the thinking it through like how do i want to change and, and um um just i don't know I, i'm having a hard time articulating but that sense of really spending time with oneself and really facing what you need to get out of this as opposed to just having it be in a party atmosphere. And that ties into all the set and setting stuff that I'm sure we'll talk about, but yeah, definitely. I think, time, I think really it is spending that time and however you process that, you know, sure. And I love, Oh, go ahead, Jill. So, okay. Thanks Kirby. Um, Ron, I love that you brought up sort of the, um, the respect and, uh, now that I've lost the other word that you used, but um, basically uh, to, to respect the process and to respect whatever uh, plant or it is that you're using and uh, in that. And so um, as far as, as setting the intention, one of the things that I do is I work with the body. I have people really drop into the body to see, to kind of experiment with or experience what is coming up for them and i feel that the body has the answers uh, for us so many answers and once we're able to kind of attune to that um, that's also part of the preparation and intention setting and that can give us uh, clues through uh, like i said for the intention setting but also throughout our journeys we can if we stay connected to the body I'll add to that, Jill. I think that a question I often work with with clients is just why now? Um, but if you can approach it through the body, that's excellent. You know, figuring out what emotions or sensations are coming up when they ask the question, like, why now? Why am I wanting to do this journey at this time in my life? There's usually other things that come up, either they're feeling cut off from some aspect of their self or they're wanting to connect to or reconnect to an aspect of the, themselves that's shut down or that they've never tapped into before. So really getting in touch with like what values or essence they wanna embody that they maybe aren't at this time. Um, and really, I mean, from my perspective, the more you can meditate on and practice that in the days coming up, leading up to the ceremony or the session itself, the better because you're sort of prepping your physical form and your spiritual form to be in that space, exploring that space, but really asking that question and intending to, to see its depth and have unconscious material come up and all this, this stuff. So thanks for your, all your input.
Yeah, beautiful. And we've had a lot of people um, join in the last couple of minutes. So I want to welcome everyone again to the Meat Delic Mushrooms event, um, first part of a three-part series. If you have any questions to the topics we're discussing, just drop them in the chat um, and we'll be having a QA and a in the last uh, 10 minutes or so. Um, so let's talk about expectation setting. Like what's, what's the difference between setting your expectations and the intentions? Um, Jill, can you talk us through that? For me personally, expectations, uh, that is kind of a, it's a, it's an interesting word and a little bit of a dicey topic because when we have expectations, um, what I've noticed in my work and in my life is that expectations can lead to uh, frustration and to disappointment. And so I find that very different than intention, right? And intention is something that we focus on that, you know, we kind of want to work toward getting. If we have an expectation, and maybe Kirby, you can define it more, and I may be mis uh, misunderstanding what you mean by expectation, but an expectation of this is how I want this to go. And more often than not, in a psychedelic journey, it doesn't go that way. And so that can kind of throw us off and, um, you know, really throw a spanner in the works and lead to, you know, sometimes what people would consider to be a bad trip, which um, so. Yeah, I, I think you, you nailed it, right? Because going in and holding on to your expectations too tightly can interfere with the whole process. So that's something I want, you know, to, to discuss. R Rowan, on a similar note, do you, when you're with goals and expectations around these trips, how do you work with your clients to manage that those expectations? I was glad you asked Jill, because I was just laughing because, you know, to me, the whole thing of an expectation with psychedelic medicine is it's, it's completely the opposite. Like, and it's like with the pizza analogy that if you are so attached to your expectations, this isn't for you because it's not going to go how you think. And there will be bumpy moments. And, it, you know, the best experiences are the most challenging ones that show you something you didn't expect. I mean, you don't, this is why I think people are drawn to work with psychedelic medicine because it brings something that you wouldn't expect. And, you know, my expertise is in ayahuasca, which is always unpredictable, always pulling the rug out from under you, always something, a new lesson, always something wow, I never would have thought that. And that's, I, I mean, that's the beauty and in, in the, the spiritual essence of it. But it, but you can't have a, you know, um, uh, you can't have your intention. I liked how Sophie said that, you know, that you're using your intention as an anchor point because you may come back to that. Like, I think I'm kind of freaking out here, but I have this intention to, to, to kind of heal this. So I'm just going to breathe and stay with this experience. But but the expectation I would have is that it's not going to, like, like Joe said, it's not going to go as you've ever expected. And that's the, maybe that's the um, definition of a really strong, positive psychedelic experience. That's how we know it's working. It, if it was the same old thing, it'd be the same old, you could just sit at home and do nothing and then it'd be the same thing. So that's, I feel like why we want to work with these plants, because they bring us knowledge that we don't have, unfamiliar territory, songs, the whole thing, you know, I, I can't say it enough, you know. <laughs> I mean, that's life, right? Like you can't hold on to the expectation too tightly. Things are going to come at you that you're not prepared for. And that's why we have you guys here and apps like MindLeap. So Sophie, people I just want to- But people do. I mean, people come to ceremonies all the time. Like, this is how it's going to go. And I want to sit here and this is how much I'm going to do. And this is, and it's like, oh boy, you're in for a, you know, you're in for a challenging night, buddy. You know, it's not going to go like that. It might be the night you cry or you're in, you know, your fetal position, you're freaking out, you know, you don't know. So it's not I mean, which pain of heart. Yeah. And that brings up a great point because oftentimes in these journeys, the client, your clients come across challenges, right? How do you prepare them, give them the mindset that you are going to come across challenges and what, what tools do you offer? Uh, Sophie, you want to take this one? Sure. I think that's a good, um, uh follow up to what we're just speaking about because I think in the intention setting process you get the opportunity already to release expectation and if you can't release expectation and let go and remember that you are not going to have control that's going to translate into your experience with the psychedelic ingestion process so I mean, intention setting, I, I always say set intention, release expectation. And of course, easier said than done. We have all of this research coming out with promising results for psychedelic assisted therapy. And so, of course, people are thinking there's a there's a magic bullet, as we see, you know, and they think maybe overnight I'm going to feel like a, a million bucks. And 
it's just, it's not the case. We have to be, we have to be cultivating curiosity and openness to absolutely whatever comes up for us. So have the anchor and the intention, but also be willing to know that the more you let go and release control and allow whatever needs to come up to come up, the better off you'll actually be because the process can just unfold as it should. And the plant medicines are intelligent. They know what to deliver, right? We think we know best. Um, So yeah, I think it's all related. I think the expectation management is a huge part of integration work um, and leaning in and and practicing letting go of control is a huge part of overcoming challenges during the psychedelic experience. And Jill, how do you prep your clients for challenges that might come up? I, I uh, absolutely agree with what, uh, what Sophie said. And so it is about sort of releasing expectations as much as possible. Um, she mentioned also leaning in. And so I might expand on that a bit from, from my perspective and how I communicate with my clients is that uh, there may be some things that come up that are upsetting or even frightening or terrifying. And um, when we close down and shrink away, uh, what we're doing is we're closing down and we're shrinking away from an opportunity to learn and to move beyond what's um, keeping us stuck in our everyday lives. The psychedelics um, are, are, we can use them in order to be, be able to move on beyond our stuckness and uh, past traumas and wounds, et cetera, that sort of thing. And so I talk to them about, you know, potentials of what could come up. They may not necessarily come up. Um, and again, the releasing the expectations. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's what's occurring to me in the moment. Roan, any thoughts? Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of, like when I work with people, I try to work with them for weeks before an experience. So I'm like, how, you know, teaching them, how do you do deep breathing practice? So when you're in a challenging moment, how do you deep, deeply breathe deep and relax? How do you calm yourself down? How in those moments can you, if there's a challenging moment or a scary moment, how do you give gratitude just in your heart because it will calm you down? How do you, you know, keep your eyes open? You know, there's like practices that I try to, or, teach people, you know, put water on your face, tell your, it's okay, it's going to be okay. This is just a moment in a moment. So I kind of have people practice those things like, okay, imagine this were happening. Um, and how, how are you going to face it? So some of it's on the physical level, some's on the spiritual level, and then the self, the self talk is what gets out of control. So we know when people get in fight or flight, there's the adrenaline dump. And that's when people start to freak out, because they're like, Oh, my God, Oh, my God, and that, there's the, the loop that starts. So if we can interrupt the loop, during the psychedelic experience, it makes the challenges quite different, especially with psilocybin and ayahuasca in my experience and also in talking to people. So that those are the key moments that you don't just freak out. There's a there's a trajectory that's happening. There's a series of things in your mind that you start getting more and more amped up. I was at an ayahuasca ceremony once and saw a guy completely freak out, you know, and start, you know, smashing things. But there was a moment where the facilitator missed that, where this guy was agitated. You know, so some of it's the, the self-soothing. Um, and then the other thing that just came up, and I everybody, you know, explain this great. It's just, it's a very dicey thing to talk about. And I think it's something, you know, because this has to be, this is all customized medicine, essentially, for the people that all of us work with, knowing them, knowing what their triggers are, knowing what might be upsetting for them and, and talking. So, you know, when this might happen about an issue about women or men or sexuality, this may have you have this experience, right? So some of it's for us as practitioners being able to see that, you know, coming. Um, but the other thing and it's a little bit unrelated, but sort of related was an ayahuasca maestro I know. He just said, you know, when you come to this ceremony, this is about cleaning and learning. And that's what's happening. And anything when you vomit or when you laugh or when you cry or when you have to go to the bathroom, you're purging out negativity. And the rest of the time, you're really learning about yourself and you're learning about the plants and you're in student mode. And just to have that like model was always very helpful for me when I was sitting with him in ceremonies. Sure. And you brought up a really great point about the different kind of themes that can come up in a journey, right? It's not some, it's not always challenging. So, you know, Sophie, I'd love to get your thoughts. What are some common themes that your clients come across when they journey? 
Oh my goodness. Uh, I think like Roan said before, it's like you, everybody's unique. There's such, such a vast um, amount of things that can occur, but I'd say, you know, holistically, we can say psychedelics reveal unseen parts of experience, right? So we're often seeing unconscious material arising, whether it's personal or transpersonal, we are getting revealed to us dimensions of ourself and of experience itself that we weren't seeing before. So whether that means it's shifting our perspective or our perception or our narrative or our storylines, um, there's something new arising. Um, and that can be really scary. That can be really overwhelming, but it can also be incredibly liberating. Sometimes people are experiencing memories as if they feel like they're living them over again. Sometimes they're just having very intense visionary experiences where they're seeing, you know, visions of what they feel is their future or family, you know, all kinds of things can come up in the visionary field. Um, as Ron mentioned too, there can be purging and versions of purging and just releasing energy or releasing something that feels like it needs to be let go of. Um, yeah, there's so many versions of what the psychedelic can occasion for different people. Um, but I would say holistically, we can think of it as just like unseen parts of ourself, unseen parts of our experience. Beautiful. Um, Jill? Yeah, and sort of uh, bypassing the conscious mind to be able to delve more into what is in our subconscious and, uh, and heal that. And not only our subconscious, but, um, and Sophie alluded to this as well, but sort of the collective unconscious, what, you know, is in our world and actually what is outside of our world. And, and so that in itself can be life-changing, of course. Um, just to have that experience. But as both Rowan and Sophie said, it's, I find it's on a really individualized basis. And the more I work with someone and, and uh, find out more about them and that uh, we can work together to focus on what would be uh, applicable for them and their healing journey. One of the things I do want to circle back around to that it just occurred to me as far as sort of um, giving some information about how to work with, with oneself once uh, we're journeying is uh, I do talk to people about having a specific um, sort of anchor word or sentence that, that they can keep coming back to. Um, and we work on that ahead of time. And um, so that they, they have that. Um, and I also want to underline the importance and Rome brought this up, but I'm bringing it up again of breath. And uh, because breath can be very grounding and also being in the body as much as possible. I know often we feel like we're out of our bodies. We we're not aware of it, but if we can bring some awareness, even touching our bodies, various parts of our bodies where we can kind of feel calm and grounding um, that's helpful as well. So. Beautiful. So after the journey, you know, psychedelic aftercare is so crucial. So how do you work with clients to take learnings from your session and incorporate them into your daily lives? So, you know, maybe Roan, I'd love to hear in days, weeks following a session, um, what sorts of things do you walk your clients through on how to integrate? Sorry, I didn't see the mute button. So I wrote a workbook about this. So I have like a whole workbook, which is, you know, like 300 pages and it's mostly sort of like questions of, so the attempt, at least from my vantage point, and this is applicable to everybody, you don't have to buy the workbook. It's like, how do you break down what happened and track it? What happened in your, in your mind? What were the insights you had? What were the physical experiences in your body that are teachings? What are the mystical or spiritual experiences? How do you categorize those? what were the insights that you had on all these different levels? And like, I, at one point I had this, I more of this image of like, you know, you're laying down and you're having this, all these experiences and how do you catalog them? So I think number one is to, you know, I, I always, when I used to go to ceremonies in the morning, people would really journal and try to like almost catalog what happened because it will be unpacked later. So much information, it's like a fire hose of, things like maybe you see a bird or you imagine that you're a crystalline structure, all these things have meaning later. So first of all, I think it's to like unpack it and, and, and kind of get your arms around it because 
maybe even the word love or heartbreak or something didn't seem significant in the night. But later on, you're like, wow, this is really, this is actually the, the key to everything. You know, or you saw an ancestor and you see this addiction pattern that I have is an ancestral wound. And it, it's like this massive amount of homework that can be unpacked. So, so for me, like the beginning part is just cataloging it. And then the next step is like, you know, I think Jill had mentioned this in the way beginning, how do you make this actionable and how do you turn this into concrete things to do? But the first thing is to kind of um, get your mind around it because you don't even know what happened. Let's just say it's a, you know, I think of it as a foreign language that we don't really have any understanding of as Westerners. We grew up in a culture like peyote people or an ayahuasca place, maybe we would understand it, but we don't understand it. And it's arrogant to even assume that we do. And so for us, we have to really figure out this language and what's being communicated to us. Um, so I think that's 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 like the beginning part, you know. And for some people, they have one experience and it's like enough for the whole rest of their life. There's like downloaded instructions to do this, 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 and this. I have a friend like that, and she moved to Costa Rica and opened a retreat center with horses and equestrian therapy, and it was one night of ayahuasca, and that was it. You know. Five years of that sounds like a beautiful life for sure. Yeah. Sophie, what sort of behaviors do you encourage your client to implement to make the aftercare more impactful? Sure. Um, I, I mean, I think this is very hard to prescribe this to many people in Western society, but I just tell people to slow down first and foremost. It's like as much as you can, can you slow down? Even in you know, we have so many demands of us in our day to day life with work and family and all these things. But if you can have them slow down as much as possible to give themselves time to journal, like Roan saying to really like give themselves free time to write and record what they what did come up for them in the process um, in the psychedelic session and give themselves time to meditate, to be in nature, to just be able to have spaces where they really can decompress and reflect. Um, and I think a huge part of aftercare is just like normalizing the experience to surround yourself, either if you have an integration coach or just a friend or people, you know, you can speak to that are supportive of the process you just went through and aren't going to make you feel you know, like misunderstood or not received. Well, um, I think that's a huge part of aftercare is just feeling like you have people that you can speak to, you know, unfiltered about this process um, and feel really received and supported by them. Um, but yeah, slowing down and just taking good care of yourself. I think Jill keeps mentioning how important the body is. So nourishing the body with good foods, being able to take a bath, if that's something you like to do, exercising, just um, really being with your experience in a more gentle sort of tender way. Oh, you bring up so many good points. Um, I loved what you said about journaling. And Jill, I'd be curious to learn from you. Are there any other habits or activities that you recommend in the you know post-integration process? Uh, not really. They've been uh, pretty much covered as far as sort of how I approach things. Um, I find that the, the journaling is my definite go-to, um, even for people who don't normally write things down, because there is a connection. And I'm talking about journaling by writing, not by putting on the computer. There's a huge difference to, uh, in doing that as far as integrating uh, what our experiences are physiologically. Um, so journaling and, um, as Sophie mentioned, talking to people um, and really, really being careful, right? Sometimes we have experiences that we're so excited about and we just want to share this. And um, as Sophie said, they may not be received well and uh, that can, there can be a lot of damage that can happen there. So that's one thing is maybe picking one or two people who you really trust if you even want to, you know, over and above the person you're working with, the therapist you're working with for integration um, to share that. Um, and also, and this goes for therapy in general um, but, and as well, is uh, to share your experience verbally. Sometimes the energy can just leak Right. And um, and we can become deflated if we share too much, even if we don't get so, uh, you know, negative feedback or whatnot. Right. So it's kind of a, about um, not necessarily not sharing, but kind of holding close to your heart, your own experience. Um, and I find that one aspect and it's not it's not a tool per se, but it's an approach 
and uh, this is the word that I was missing before, Roan, when I, I referred to you, but uh, you mentioned humility. And I want to bring that up again, because to have uh, humility around our experiences with these medicines, I, I find to be really important in terms of being able to integrate this. Um, because, uh, yeah because it is all awe-inspiring and more than we can actually understand. And we are just experiencing it. So to be able to be humble around in that experience, I think is a really important aspect to be able to integrate it and move forward. Beautiful. And go ahead, Ron. One more thing. I, great description, Jill. This is, a, this, is a tough, this is a really tough thing to, I think, to articulate. Um, it just triggered a memory I had, and this may not be applicable always, but in, like a lot of native traditions that work with peyote, one of the things is you, after any experience, you would, there's like in this cycle of learning, you, know, you seek, you have this experience, and then their integration is that you make something, like you do an artistic thing that represents it, you know, and I just think that that's a really beautiful thing to do. I mean, I'm not a textile person, but I see, I have a lot of textiles from Peru and around the world that are beautiful and I've always thought that that's a great thing to do, even to collage or to um, to make something out of, you know, a bunch of sticks or something that really feels like I've honored this experience in nature and using the natural world as like a, as an anchor point to make it, you know, because the journaling is great for the mind, but it's like there's a whole different spirit. And what do we do to honor the spirit? And I, I don't have an answer for that. And it's a very tricky question, right? But like something we we take a plant from nature how do we do something that's nat nature-based? Because we're nature-based people and we're ingesting this knowledge that's forever from these plants. And what do we do, you know? So I don't know, I just wanted to throw that out as just something that, that you know, that, that I've done at different times, it's beautiful, even if it's drawing or carving or uh, making jewelry, you know, something like this that really, like I'm wearing a necklace from Peru that I made that feels like this really honored my experience and I can touch it and feel it and there's something I think about making something real that that helps ground the experience as well. Yeah, and that artistic expression is is great. Well, you guys all mentioned the word community, which is so important in psychedelics and how we share and how we connect, especially, you know, we've all been through this pandemic, so everything's so virtual now, which, you know, is great because, you know, for the audience, everyone here, all of these um, workers are on Mindly, the app. And so I'd love to take a moment and talk about how we can use technology to connect in the integration process. And Nick, maybe this would be a great place for you to kick us off and share the pros and cons of like connecting virtually. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for the discussion. And all the panelists have done a great job so far of speaking about the integration process. And I think underlying all of it is this um you know, ability for this stuff to be done, a lot of it virtually, which is really excellent, especially um, obviously in light of the onset of COVID-19 and like, even though things are emerging and, and we're excited maybe to an extent, there's still a lot of pros to doing this work through a virtual health model. Um, much like this conference itself allows, a lot of people are able to gain access to these people's wisdom and to this discussion, and to this community from the comfort of their own homes or from a remote location. So I think some of the advantages I would say, one would be, well, I guess from a, uh, starting from the two things I think that were really mentioned, one is having somebody that you can go to for support whether that's the coach, therapist, counselor that you're working with for integration, it can take place in a virtual health setting. It can definitely take place upon MindLeap, which I'll get to in a bit. And then the other thing would be, what about these mindfulness practices that you might be pursuing on your own, whether they're somatic, they're journaling, artistic expression. There are a bit, There's options out there. There's access to a lot of resources out there, many of which, again, exists on MindLeap, which I'd love to go into a curated library of content that we provide. But um, I think both of those things are possible. And then some of the pros I think uh, I just alluded to quickly here would be that people from different states can meet with people in different states, people from different you know, nations can do that same thing. Um, so geographic distance is uh, overcome. And then, an, you know, that's one of the more obvious ones. And then one of the ones that we maybe aren't inclined to think about, but is definitely a big deal. I mean, in my therapeutic work, I worked with people who faced a lot of barriers to receiving treatment and going in for help seeking. And 
the virtual space gives people a sense of anonymity because they can go into their offices or they can go into their workspaces and say, hey, I need to take a call. And the people around them, their friends, their colleagues, their family members don't need to necessarily know what that call is. Whereas if they have to explain that they have to drive somewhere to go somewhere, sometimes there's maybe a little bit more questioning. So I think that sense of anonymity gives people um, security in feeling, uh, you know, welcomed into the space and not necessarily facing as many attitudinal barriers. So those are the things that that come to mind. Yeah, thank you. And I think this would be a great time to just talk about MindLeap. So we've actually got some slides if we could throw those up. Um, so MindLeap, MindLeap Health is a virtual health platform that provides users with inner wellness resources to assist them in their daily mental health journey. MindLeap features a community of professionals, a private health journal, and an ever-expanding content library that includes meditations, psychoeducation materials from experts of mental health. MindLeap provides the space for users to video conference with professionals who can support them in the psychedelic integration, as well as their inner wellness journeys more broadly. Um, and everyone here today is a MindLeap counselor and coach. Um, so, you know, Jill, could you share a moment with us about your experience connecting with patients virtually using the MindLeap app and more? Sure. Um, my experience connecting with patients virtually um, has been mixed, which I'll go into, um, but the overarching uh, thought that I have that I just want to say off the hop is uh, I'm incredibly grateful for the, for the fact that we have this ability now, especially during COVID. Um, it's just obviously a crazy time. And so a lot of people who would be otherwise isolated um, have the ability to reach out and we have the ability to be able to be there for them. Um, so there's, so there's that. Um, as far as sort of the virtual therapy goes um, and support, uh, I find it um, a little bit challenging in that when I'm with someone you know, face to face in a room, um, it, it does feel different. Um, I'm able to see their whole bodies. And so to be able to sort of like read what's going on there and feel what's going on there, um, there's, it's, I find it easier to kind of co-regulate our nervous systems sort of align when we're in the same room together. So that uh, really helps sort of in the therapeutic process as well. Um, and so those are sort of, and also I'm able to support people actually, um, you know, if they're going through something really, really big, I feel more comfortable supporting them physically in, in the same physical proximity. So that being said, um, back to my overarching gratitude for this ability to be able to connect with people online. Um, I am, am surprised with actually how easy the transition was for me uh, to be able to meet with people. Um, and, um, and in fact, I can see their faces more easily and, and then I can sitting across the room from them. So there are benefits to that as well. As far as the co-regulation goes, yes, it's better in person. However, that can still happen where it's like if I'm able to maintain my calm, um, I can still help someone maintain or, or come back to a place of calm when I'm working with them, even if it is via uh, the internet. Um, there's a... The, the whole thing of convenience and everything that Nick mentioned too, right? Sometimes there's a bit of a stigma um, attached to uh, seeking out any sort of support whatsoever. Um, and I will, yeah. And so to be able to meet with people sort of in person privately, the convenience of being able to be in their own home. And then once you hang up, then you can get on with your day instead of having to drive half an hour back to work or whatever it is, right? So yeah, um, I find that the benefits outweigh the, um, the negative aspects of it. Sure, and it sounds like it's an opportunity to find the right mix, right? There are ways that both in-person and virtual help support the whole process. So that's amazing, thank you. Um, Roan, what are your thoughts on virtual Mind Leap? I mean, you know, I feel like an old guy where it's, you know, it's not a natural transition for me, but, you know, like for me, I've always had this association. I mean, I've been leading groups for more than 20 years, so it's been a big transition. But with COVID, I've been surprised at how wonderful it's been. I mean, I, I like seeing people. I like being around them, but 
it's also the world we live in and it's not always practical. Like, um, you know, I work with people all over the world. I would have, I can't do that in person. Somebody can't, you know, I talked to somebody in Ireland this morning, you know, so um, there's something amazing about it. And maybe there's certain things that I can't do that I, you know, I can't touch somebody physically. I can't do hands-on healing, but I've led groups and done in-person stuff all through um, COVID time. And I, you know, I do, I'm part of like a prayer group, like a sweat lodge community. And we did virtual sweat lodges, which we've never, you know, these are, non-psychedelic experiences, but I would have never thought that we would do this virtually, but it worked really well. So even creating a spiritual ritual container, you can do virtually. And so for me, the people that I work with, it's worked out really well. And there's, I think the time savings too, like, yeah, like Jill said, you don't have to drive over here. It's, it's quick. And that's, what's great about the mind leap thing is you can set up a short appointment and, you know, or you can talk frequently that there's something about that, that I think serves people in the world that we're living in really well and is efficient and it still feels really intimate. It doesn't, there's not a disconnect at all. There, you can still feel somebody's heart and feel their spirit, you know, virtually. Beautiful. Um, Sophie, what's your experience been like with the virtual community? Um, everyone, Jill and Ron have both mentioned important points. And I think the one thing I would add is that, you know, the, what's the selling point like, the comfort of your own home. I mean, I experience like people being in their own spaces are experiencing a different level of comfort. I mean, even though, of course, as therapists, we create a very warm, welcoming space. I think there really is something to the fact that the mind can loosen, the emotions can loosen when someone can kind of unwind and unravel in their own space. There is something to that. I would also add something which is, uh, I think as practitioners, we really hope that our clients become their own guides, like that they become the master of their own kind of tools on their own. And that's what we kind of want to give them, right? We want to provide them the tools for them to really feel the strength and confidence to navigate their their uh, life on their own. And so there's something to the, the bit of a disconnect we experience on virtual platforms actually gives people the sense that they really are doing that. You know, they're in their own space, they're in their own life, and then they have us as um, an external guide. Um, an influence, but we're really like helping them build on their own life. So I think that's a, a major benefit of any virtual connection. Um, and yeah, I mean, let's be honest, convenience, man, people just they want things to be convenient, they want their time to be managed well, and they love that they can just sign right on <laughs> and not get in their car and commute 35 minutes. I mean, you know, it's it's the world we're living in. So I have to laugh at that. But there's a benefit. Great, thank you so much. And before we get into the Q&A, Nick, I thought I'd give you a chance to talk about maybe the best ways that people can find MindLeap, how to get started. You sure, thanks. That? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, at, I mean, what people covered, I think is is really right up the alley of what MindLeap offers. Um, it's a variety of solutions. And to Sophie's last point here about wanting people to become their own masters of their journeys, really what MindLeap is designed to do is to meet people along in their journeys, wherever they're at, both their inner wellness journeys, whether that concerns psychedelic integration or not. And, and the variety of resources, I mean, the chart that you had shown really highlights that with these three different components. The first being the community, um, you know, and as the person who's heading up the community and with three community members here before you, um, I think that's been demonstrated that this is a professional space. It's a curated, uh, or I say, should say it's a vetted set of people who are providing that support. So that's uh, what you can access um, as a user out there. If you're looking for a solution, if you're looking for somebody to connect with for your integration needs, that's what the community space at MindLeap offers. It also has the second point is this health journal, which is a completely private and secure space for people to um, engage in their own monitoring of their well being and activities that they engage in. Um, and then finally would be this curated inner wellness library, which has a number of meditations, sound journeys, and psychoeducation, educational content that people can consume. So it's all very accessible. It all exists within uh, the MindLeap app. I mean, um, what we're talking about here today is really what's coming soon here on MindLeap. So we're very excited for the release of new updates into MindLeap 2.0. Um, it's an exciting time for us. It's an exciting time for our community members. Um, people would, I would invite people to explore our website 
website to explore um, our app and to look forward to um, you know the anticipated release of 2.0 taking place in just a few weeks. Awesome. Well, great. I think we got about 10 minutes left. So I want to go ahead and get to the audience Q&A. I am pulling up the questions now. The first question we have is from Libby. Um, can any of the panelists elaborate on any experiences they've had preparing clients with tapering off SSRIs and other meds that might interfere in what they've learned about this process? Jill? No. <laughs> <laughs> that's the uh that's the short answer um i personally don't deal with that because i'm not a medical professional and so what i do is i recommend that my clients if they are on ssris or any other medication that they speak to their doctor they tell them exactly what their intention is what they want to be doing and then have guidance uh, for medical guidance from their doctor. And then I come in once that's all been taken care of, but I don't have the um, it's, it's not my area of expertise. So I don't even go there. Sorry. I can't be more helpful. Yes. Yeah, so definitely consult a professional. Right. Yeah. Um, I think just to hop in, I think, I think that might be a little bit beyond the scope of what uh, these people deal with. And I think uh, that's an important distinction to be made is that you should always consult with primary care physician for anything dealing with medication, prescriptions, things like that should always take place within a, a professional doctor setting. Perfect. It's... All right. And the next question is from Lauren. How can we assess post experienced, whether they are purgings, visionaries, our parts, trans narratives from others. Sorry, I'm gonna, how can we access after experiences, be it purgings, visions, how do we assess that? Roan? Well, I think the beginning part is to understand what they were, right? So, I mean, you're having, so it's like, you know, you're having this experience. When you're in the psychedelic experience, you're in it, you're not narrating it. You don't have the little person inside you from above watching. I mean, you're observing yourself having the experience, but this is a post experience thing that you need to then unpack. So let's say you did ayahuasca and you purged all night. What did that later, you're gonna find out what that meant. Or maybe at the time when you're doing that, when you're purging, you're aware like, Jesus, this is the stuck energy from this childhood trauma I had when I was six. Oh my God, blah, let's get it out of me. You know, something like this. I mean, oftentimes when people are purging, they they have a sense like, God, this just feels like heavy stuck crap. I just want to get rid of it. I was at a ceremony once with a, a group of people who were former Mormons and somebody started yelling, you know, screw Joseph Smith, you know, and they were, you know, hopefully that's not offensive, but you know, it was like they were purging this energy. So some of this is identifying what's going on. And it's the same thing with all the things that you mentioned. It's like, what are, I mean, only you can answer this, you know, this is the exact reason why you need a, a, an integration coach is that this is specialized, customized to you. This is your language and your dialogue with this medicine. And I can't give you, here's the one thing to do because I don't know you and it's gonna show up as a complete different metaphor for you. Like I, I once, for example, you know, vomited a bunch at an ayahuasca ceremony and I felt like a tarantula came out of my mouth. And the, I asked the ceremony leader and he said, that was all your ancestral crap coming out of your mouth. And that's what that represents in his cosmology. So these are really specific questions that you can sit with and also you need to ask somebody. It's not a, there's no like dictionary, you know, reader's digest guide to the, vision, you have a vision of a snake and that's what it means. There's a lot of this stuff is stuff that is meant to, I think, I think one of the, the problems is that these take a long time to unpack. This is a mystery. This is a, a lengthy thing. It's not a snap your fingers and understand. These are things to existential questions to wrestle with. And so there is no shortcut. And if you want a shortcut, maybe psychedelic medicine isn't for you because this is, you know, this is like the heavy, heavy hitter league, you know? So that, that's what I would say is to be patient and let the stuff unfold and have somebody, a guy that you trust, that you can talk it through, that can kind of hold space for you. Sure. And Sophie, did you want to add, it looked like you were maybe reaching to unmute. Um, yeah, I just would like to add something, which I think is actually sort of what Ron's already speaking to, but um, 
you know, there, there can be so much information in one ceremony and people can get sort of hung up on how, like, how should I interpret this? How should I interpret this? Like Ron is saying, if we attach ourselves too much to knowing, oh, well, this was definitely a memory from when I was six. Is that useful? You know, like at the end of the day, like, is that helping us? Is it hurting us? Are we getting too hung up and attached on knowing? Um, we really have to allow ourselves the space and the time to see if more insight comes in the weeks and months following. If we want to interpret and know exactly what's ours and what isn't ours in the beginning, we're we're going to be confused and we'll kind of miss out on the opportunity to be in the mystery of it, like Ron identified. Beautiful. I'll say one more quick thing. I know we don't have a lot of time, but go I think it. that's one of the ways to vet the set and setting of the experience you want to go through. So for me, like if I want to be in a group, I want to know that the group is processing in the morning or as a group that we're having this experience because maybe I'm in a ceremony with Sophie and what she's experienced is what I'm experiencing or what she has to say in the morning. I was like, oh my God, that's that's so brilliant. That's exactly what I need to hear. Or Jill says something, you know, the, it's back to the community thing is that when I hear the community sharing, I'm like, oh my God, you experienced that? Oh, that's a piece of my story. And a lot of this is story narration. You know, we're, we're reclaiming our story in these in these medicine ceremonies. So I think that's really important as you decide to do the work, but yeah. Beautiful. Um, here is a question about frequency. So I'm curious if there's a suggested or reasonable frequency one could or should journey to see benefit before becoming it, before it becoming too much. Do you guys have recommendations on how you approach how often people should be journeying? I personally don't. Again, it, I feel like it's an individual um, process and uh, something that my clients and I do talk about. Um, and each individual client um, has been different as part uh, in terms of what's of benefit to them and um, have they fully integrated, you know, what needs to be integrated from the last journey and that sort of thing. So there is no... Um, set sort of pattern uh, that I've discovered. Sure. Um, and then last question, um, what background or certifications does someone need to have to become a Mind Leap specialist? Does Mind Leap have a certification program for psychedelic assisted therapy? Nick, you want to take this one? Absolutely. It's a great question. I'll answer first. We don't yet have a certification program. There are some certification programs that exist out there. Um, there's no uh, like unified consensus upon you know things that would allow someone to be like a licensed let's say psychedelic assisted therapist um again the trajectory i guess like the landscape of how this is going to look has yet to unfold at least in the united states um what mindleap does is that mindleap provides integration solutions for people with professionals who operate through a coaching framework so it's a little bit different than pursuing a typical therapeutic route um these people um aren't necessarily operating under their licenses in order to be providing this work. This is rather coaching around integration. So that's the number one distinction I would make. In terms of the vetting uh, process, there's a lot that goes into it in terms of who we take on as one of our specialists. Um, there's a screening process, an interview process. I mean, all the folks in here before you have gone through it themselves. Um, there's training that we have associated with it in terms of um, a few things. So it all contributes to the vetting process, but I think it's an important distinction that there um, it's hard to know who out there can support you in integration. Um, so there is some wisdom that goes into the selection of this. Um, it's a carefully reviewed, uh, there's careful review that goes into each application and uh, the specialists that are, um, present on the Mind Leap space, again, have all successfully passed through that vetting process. Um, if somebody out there does have experience in this and they're interested in furthering their integration work and doing so in a virtual setting, um, by all means, there's the ability to um, apply to become an integration specialist on Mind Leap that's present on our website. Thank you. Um, well, we are about out of time. I want to thank everyone, Roan, Jill, Sophie, Nick. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, our friends at Midasin, thank you for powering this event. Again, this is Meet Delic. Be sure to check out. We're sending the links to you in the chat now. Check out 
all of our socials. Come to the Meet Dalek event in no November. We hope to see you there. Um, thanks everyone again and um, have a great day.